Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, three. City, city, sibilance, sibilance. Levels check, good, sounds good. One, two, three, rolling and... The most important thing is that you have the trust of the people that you're filming. They allow you access to things that, you know, as an outsider, you would assume they might want to keep hidden. I don't let myself drown into a situation where I'm not capable to, to film anymore because maybe I'm feeling too emotional or, or stress. Intimate personal feelings usually come after the filming. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode 102, and it is brought to you by the Doc Lifer Elite Mastermind, an exclusive weekly mastermind where filmmakers come together for support, guidance, and empowerment to make their best doc films and lead their best doc lives. Last week, I talked about how when I went to Cambodia to work on a current doc project, Elvis of Cambodia, I was constantly bogged down physically and mentally with the sheer amount of gear that I was always traveling around with. If you haven't listened to it, I'd recommend maybe going back and listening to our first episode of Season 2, Episode 101, since it's the first in our nine-part series that we're doing called Chris in Cambodia. This is part two of that series, where we'll take a look at, among other things, how to be essential when making your gear choices, in particular when doing film work overseas. And at the end, as a bonus, we'll tell you where you can take a look at my essential doc film gear list. So with that, let's go back to December in Rochester, New York, where it's snowy and cold. I'm packing my gear for my big annual trip to Portland, Oregon, where every year I take part in a big three-week corporate video gig that I've been doing for years. One of the weeks usually consists of a whirlwind three- or four-day shooting tour in five or six different cities in the Pacific Northwest and the Southwest of the U.S., some combination of Seattle, Portland, Boise, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, San Francisco. They're often on the docket for said whirlwind adventure. I'm usually one man banding the operation or taking my friend and colleague and boss, Michael, with me on these trips. These videos, they end up getting used at the annual conference that this big time independent copier company puts on every year for its employees and spouses. And by annual conference, I do mean rock and roll show extravaganza. If you've ever been lucky enough to participate in one of these types of events or produced video for this kind of thing, it's partly a meeting that looks at the company's yearly numbers, partly an excuse to party on the company's dime, and partly an excuse to make some really good money making some videos that no one will ever see beyond the day of the event, which, by the way, is probably best for all involved. I've gotten to know many of the employees for the company throughout its branches. I love working with Michael, and I love making some money at the end of the year and beginning of the new year. I've only missed one of these gigs in the past eight, and that was because I was in Cambodia when we were first working on Elvis. Which brings me to what I was doing two days after the three-week gig ended, going to Cambodia to work on Elvis. Which is what was making packing so damned tricky. Not only did I need to pack for shooting for three weeks on this job, but I'd also be packing for then going to shoot in Cambodia. If you guessed the climate in January in Portland was different from January and February in Cambodia, well, you guessed right. 
So along with making sure that I had all of the necessary gear for both major but entirely different shoots, I was going to need to be smart about what I packed for clothing. But for the purpose of this, I'll try and stick to what I packed for gear, which as you already know from last week's episode, turned out to be too much. But you know, to be fair, I was packing gear from two entirely different shoots. So as I was packing for the corporate gig in America, I was also packing for the passion project in Cambodia. So my initial approach was to take out my pad of paper and pencil and jot down the types of equipment that I was going to most certainly use for both shoots. And I suppose it's worth noting that at least in America, I knew that I had accessibility to whatever I might need should I be in a jam on one of those shoots. I had plenty of film industry colleagues in Portland, and of course, there's always the trusty B&H or Amazon if I needed something shipped quickly. Which actually brings me to one of the pieces of gear I knew that I was most definitely going to need for both shoots. Lights. Now, I owned a set of LED light panels that I'd been using for many years. They were packed neatly into a big carrying case that was pretty easy to check in. However, these were purchased probably six or seven years ago. They were still very heavy. LED technology had come a long way since then. They're now smaller, lighter, use less power, and, and, and yet put out more luminance. Like those flexi LED panels that are out there now. Yeah, now that made sense to me. Why carry around this heavy bag of three light panels when I could pick up a few of the flexies, which I could easily stow neatly into some other bag? And the price on these flexies were quite reasonable. I was going to make good money on the corporate gig, and these would be pretty packable and lightweight to travel around with. So I made the spur of the moment decision to leave my old LED panels behind, making a mental note to sell these later on to help defer some of the costs of the new ones. And I bought a few of the flexible LEDs and had them overnighted to my initial destination in Portland, Oregon, where I had the first of many shoots. Good, that was easy. What was next? I looked around me at my pile of gear, trying to decide what else would be absolutely necessary on both continents. Well, certainly sound, right? But the question was, which lavs, shotgun, and or external recorders to take? Now, this is a tough one for me. I generally like to try and pack as lightly as possible. I know, I know, that's, that's not what I said last week. But again, we must take into account that I was packing for two very distinct shoots. I generally try and pack lightly. But I also generally try and have some kind of backups with me. If you've been a long-time listener of the program, you would know that I've been burnt before, and in nearly catastrophic fashion. It was in Nepal, on my dock journey to Kathmandu, when during that first week, my primary camera, and by primary, I mean only camera, it died on me. I was very fortunate to be able to find a Nepalese dock filmmaker who rented me a camera that was quite comparable to the one that I brought with me. I basically lucked out, though. There were definitely a few days there where I truly thought my ship was sunk before it had even managed to leave the port. Since then, I try and bring some kind of backup of major equipment with me. It doesn't have to be exact backups, but something that will at least get the job done adequately should a mishap occur. This time out, as a primary camera, I had our Canon C300 Mark II. My backup plan was our old Canon 70 DSLR. Sure, a far inferior option to the C300 Mark II, but it could work in a pinch. But going back to sound, I was bringing a Sony wireless lavalier, but also I had a Sony wired option, should the wireless go down or run into any kind of interference. Actually, a little secret here. I try and use the old, archaic-looking wired lavalier option whenever I can. In this way, I don't ever have to worry about interference, but I also kind of like the sound a bit better. Plus, if you don't have a dedicated sound person, it allows for you to have one less thing to worry about, in this case, fiddling with the sound. A wired option, it allows you to simply run your XLR between your subject and your camera, put on your headphones, check your levels, and you should be good to go. So I survey the room at my belongings again and I start gathering more of my essentials and some of their backups. And I begin to start putting them into bags. 
Now, one thing I want to mention here about packing bags is that I highly recommend getting a couple of those really big duffel bags that you can usually find in an outdoor store, like, like an REI. Make sure though that they're not oversized bags, you know, make sure and, and check travel allowances for your airlines. But you'd be surprised at the dimensions that you can actually get away with. What this means is that you can stow something like your tripod in one of these big duffel bags. Your tripod in its protective case, it doesn't have to be a separate piece to check in now. You get to pack it into the duffel bag along with other pieces of gear. Just make sure that you're weighing your bags before you head to the airport. You don't want to end up being one of these people who ends up trying to shuffle items in and out of bags up at the check-in counter because they're not making the weight limits. So there's this really great little device I use. It's a digital luggage scale. I always travel with this and it allows me to instantly weigh my bags. Basically, you hold the scale in your hand, which is attached to a belt that you loop through your bag. You pick up the bag and voila, it tells you the weight of the bag down to a tenth of a pound or kilogram. That thing has saved me many a headache and dollar. It's Tuesday, January 22nd of 2019, and I've just finished up with the marathon of a job. I'm at the airport getting ready to finally embark for Cambodia. I'm at the check-in counter, and I'm loading my bags to the belt. I'm smiling to myself as all three bags that I check in come in just slightly under the maximum allowable weight for the flight. After paying the exorbitant fee of $200 for the additional bag, I sling my small backpack over my shoulder. This backpack has my passport, tickets, laptop, and drives. And I grab my other carry-on bag, which contains the camera and lenses. And I grab my other carry-on bag, which is a roll-on, which contains the camera and lenses, and I make my way to security. Now, I know that a lot of you probably check your camera gear in at the counter, but I've just never been able to bring myself to do that. Most any job that I've ever been on, you know, where I've been freelancing, they've all put all of the camera lenses in big protective Pelican cases to travel. Of course, the production company carries some hefty insurance, as do we. But still, I personally, I've just never felt comfortable being disconnected from my camera. So for years, I've been rolling, literally, by the way, with this really cool case made by Think Tank that looks like any other carry-on luggage, which is part of the beauty of it, right? Only it's specially made for camera gear. Inside, it has removable Velcro sections and padding, so it'll, it'll fit most any medium-sized camera and a lens or two. I swear by this thing. I make my way to security, Already secure in the knowledge that all of the other bags that I've been toting around for the past month is now out of my hands and will hopefully magically show up on the other side of this trip. In this case, Phnom Penh, Cambodia. I can't help but smile again. This is what I've been waiting for weeks to do. No, no, that's actually not right at all. This is what I've been waiting a few years to do. Get back to Cambodia and back to the film that I love working on. As I inch closer to security, I get my tickets and passport to hand. And the dream becomes the reality once again. Thanks for tuning in to part two of our Chris in Cambodia segment. As a sort of supplement to today's story, I've written up a special blog post called My Essential Doc Film Gear List that goes into more detail about some of the exact gear that I highly recommend you consider bringing if you're planning on going on a similar film trip in the future. And you can easily find that article by going to thedocumentarylife.com slash blog. Next up on TDL, I'll be highlighting this week's Doc Lifer's story, and that will be followed up by our conversation with filmmakers James Jones and Olivier Sarbeel, the duo behind On the President's Orders, a doc in the middle of an impressive film festival run, including just this past week where it played at Hot Docs. That and so much more coming up next here on The Documentary Life. Something I wanted to mention before continuing on with today's show. You've probably noticed that we're playing around with some pretty cool fresh sounds on this season of TDL. And I'd like to thank Music Vine for supplying us with those cool fresh sounds. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about how Music Vine might be able to serve your doc project, you can check out the show notes for today's episode, or you can simply go to their website at musicvine.com.
Hey Doc Lifer, Chris here. You know, when I look back on my documentary filmmaking journey, I can see that I did a lot of things wrong. But I also did some things right, and one of those things was joining a mastermind. I have found masterminds in both my personal and professional life to be extremely motivating and beneficial. I have invested in myself, in my goals and intentions as a filmmaker, and received exponential results. Masterminds give you direct access to like-minded, supportive, and experienced people who get you. They understand what you're trying to do and why, and can help you achieve your filmmaking goals more efficiently and successfully. They can make your whole filmmaking experience much more enjoyable, lucrative, and empowering. That is why I'm so excited to be announcing our first ever Doc Lifer Elite Mastermind. Doc Lifer Elite Mastermind members will meet every week for a live group coaching call led by myself and Steph, as well as have access to a private members only Facebook group where we can be in daily contact. It'll be you, me, Steph, and a handful of other doc filmmakers giving guidance and advice, keeping you accountable and answering your questions on funding, distribution, building a team, your doc lifestyle, basically anything that's holding your film back or can move your film forward. Each and every week, we'll be guiding you to greater success and empowerment with your film, as well as working through personal or lifestyle challenges that may be holding you and your project back. For more information and to submit your application, go to thedocumentarylife.com slash mastermind. Once you're approved, you'll get immediate access to the exclusive Facebook group and to our live group coaching calls, which start on Tuesday, May 7th, where we can begin to help you take your doc film and your doc life exactly where you want it to go. We'll see you there, Doc Lifer. Welcome to our second ever Doc Lifer stories. In the spirit of connectivity and togetherness of the documentary filmmaking world, which is the essence of why we started the TDL podcast, we are bringing you stories from Doc Lifers, Doc filmmakers like you and I from around the world. If you're interested in contributing your story to Doc Lifer Stories, we'd love to hear from you. Simply write to us at chris at barongfilms.com. Your contribution will help to foster the TDL mission of building a supportive and networked community of doc filmmakers throughout the world. Today's Doc Lifer Story comes from a professor and filmmaker out of Virginia. His name is Josh Davidsberg, and he is not only one of our most active members on the TDL Community Facebook group, but he is also an enrollee of our online doc filmmaking courses platform, and he is one of our longtime listeners of the show. When asked what Josh had learned about doc filmmaking that he wished he'd known before, he responded with this, I wish I had started the fundraising earlier. I went out and just started shooting. I am fortunate that I have a job where I have the time to shoot side projects, and I am expected to do this. I think that was a blessing because I could afford to go out and start on my own, and a curse because I didn't think through the budget, so I didn't raise money for post until later on. I edited on my own, that was always my plan, but I needed money for music, an audio engineer, and color, which I still may do on my own. I also needed money for E&O insurance. I kept putting it off until the absolute last minute because I didn't really know what I was doing. We raised about $20,000 through crowdfunding and individual donations, but I think I could have raised more through grants if I'd started earlier. I only wish I had known what was fair use and what would be copyright infringement. Near the end of the edit, I found a really good lawyer who came on pro bono, but I was really stressed about it earlier. We were following drag queens who lip sync, so I worried we'd have to pay a lot of money for their music or cut it out completely. He and another lawyer in the firm watched the film, researched the music, and assuaged my fears, verifying that because it was occurring naturally, it would fall under fair use. I probably would have shot some scenes slightly differently if I realized that from the beginning. To read more of Doc Life or Josh Davidsberg's story, you can either go to the show notes for this episode or go directly to the documentarylife.com slash blog. This is where current and all future Doc Lifer stories live. Check it out and do consider contributing your own Doc Lifer story today.
I am joined by filmmakers James Jones and Olivier Sarbiel today. James Jones is a two-time Emmy Award-winning and five-time BAFTA-nominated director. His films are broadcast around the world, primarily on the BBC, Channel 4, and PBS's front line. Olivia Sarbiel is an award-winning French documentary director and Emmy-winning cinematographer based in London. Before turning his lens to film, Olivier worked as a broadcast cameraman in television news. Over the past decade, Olivier has covered conflicts and critical social issues across Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Europe, and North America. The Emmy-winning Mosul was his film that he co-directed alongside with James Jones. Sarbil and Jones again teamed up on this year's feature documentary, On the President's Orders, a doc that takes a look at the drug war in the Philippines, produced with the cooperation of Frontline PBS, Arte France, and BBC Storyville. Gentlemen, welcome to the Documentary Life. I'm very excited to be speaking with the both of you today. Great, great to talk to you. Uh, great to talk to you. And we'll start with you, James, first. I'd love to hear how the both of you, how you guys first got involved filming conflict overseas. And why was this sort of subject genre, if you will, of documentary, why was this appealing to you? So I guess I, I would say that I fell into, you know, conflict or, or kind of tougher situations abroad completely by accident really mm. <laughs> um my interest was journalism and, and then increasingly filmmaking uh but i started off making kind of observational verite documentaries about kind of social issues at home so yes, homelessness right. or yeah as you mentioned suicide in the military yeah and i i guess like as my ambitions grew there, there were stories around the world that became possibilities through working with kind of international broadcasters and i did a film about north korea which mm. is obviously not an easy to, uh, place to make a film about and kind of <laughs> off the back of that somehow i started getting you know pushed more towards you know difficult places and difficult stories abroad but i mean hopefully still retaining the kind of observational you know character driven approach to storytelling that i would had before but it was completely by accident i've never kind of presented myself as a kind of war junkie frontline kind of guy but just that, that it just kept kept happening people would you know the next suggestion would be a film that happened to be somewhere and how about yourself olivier well i have a different background i'm actually coming from the news world yeah so i start my career pretty late actually in uh, 2010 and since 2010 for several years i have covering mostly social issues and conflict, war in Iraq, Libya, Syria, Central African Republic, Mali, Ukraine. I have also a, a military background, actually. Mm. I used to be a, a marine paratrooper, uh, but I've always been very passionate by the pictures. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That is my first passion. And conflict came a bit naturally for me. I want to link my passion for the pictures and the experience that I have in the army. But again, like James, you know, you know, I don't really like to be called a war reporter. A war um, I'm also not yeah. <laughs> a, yeah, war, the world, a, a war junkie. I have yeah. been seriously wounded in 2011 right. uh, uh, during the war in Libya, during the battle for CERT. I spent uh, eight months, nine months in a military hospital and mm. lost a part of my right hand. Uh, but it then took away my passion for... Uh, for, for, for the lens for filming. And it's only two years and a half ago that I start to turn my lens to longer format, yeah. to documentary. So there's obviously a lot of crossover between your interests and your passions and the type of work that you obviously currently do, but some of the work that you have done in the past. Where and how did you guys first, first meet? <laughs> we get asked this a lot. Um, and certainly when we first met, we didn't think that we'd spend the next two years basically in the same room or in the field together. But um, we met, Olivier just got back from, from Mosul on the front line filming with the Iraqi special forces. Yeah. Uh, and I just finished a, a doc about police shootings in America. And uh, basically there was a slot that PBS Frontline needed to fill for a short film. And I just got a text on a Saturday saying, hey, do you want to come in and edit this great material we've got for a couple of weeks? Oh, wow. And I thought, yeah, why not? And then, you know, the footage was unlike any war footage I'd ever seen. Yeah. Really. It was just like extraordinarily beautiful, you know, really intimate access. The 
the soldiers kind of forgot that Olivier was there. And so we cut this like 20 minute film. And I think all of us thought, you know, this was Olivier's first time making, you know, even a, something that long. But I think all of us felt Jeez. that this had the potential to be something, you know, more substantial and, you know, maybe a feature or whatever. And so I kind of came on board initially as like a producer to kind of, and then Olivier went back out to the front line. Mm. And then, you know, so I, we were kind of, figuring out how this would work as a longer film and then Olivier and I went out and interviewed all the soldiers yeah. together M most of whom actually were sitting there kind of covered in bandages having been wounded you know half, half the people Olivier was with were killed mm. uh, or injured and then you know so somehow our skills kind of complemented each other and we didn't want to throttle each other at the end of the process <laughs> and we thought you know what what subjects could our talents kind of lend themselves to um, and you know, the story in the Philippines, Duterte's drugs war was something we've been following oh, yeah. for a long time. Oh, yeah. um, and so as soon as the edit for most were finished, we got on a plane out to Manila to figure out, you know, whether it would be possible. <laughs> and, you know, James, I can see you one can see very quickly how you would be taken by by Olivier's cinematography. It's as it's, it's as you have suggested here that there is an intimacy that you don't often see in this type of frontline ask material. Um, that's really quite stunning. And, uh, and I'm speaking for both Mosul as well as, of course, the current one uh, on the president's orders. Speaking of front lines, you guys are often, you know, kind of on the front lines in the work that you're doing. I think I'll ask you first, Olivier, working on the front lines, what his, how has your military background helped you uh, in your documentary filmmaking on the front lines? If we're talking about the Philippine, obviously, heaven door, you know, sometimes it was a bit stressful, but we cannot compare it to a, to a battlefield situation, mm. to a war zone. Mm. So obviously the challenge is, uh, is totally different. I guess one of the first thing is to build the relationship with the people we have met on the film, especially, for example, in Mosul, the soldiers. I think it's helping me to win the trust of the guy on the ground mm. because they know I was in the army. It helps me, obviously, because... I know how those guys moves. I know I know how they think. I know how to interact with them. But to be fair, you know, when it comes to a war zone and conflict, it doesn't matter how experienced you are. Mm. You know, anything can happen, and it happens to me in 2011 in Libya. Yeah. Uh, but definitely a plus. And again, in the Philippines, when we met our a uh, character, and, and maybe we'll we'll going back to it later. It, it was also helpful to have that background, you know, they kind of gave like for those guys some sort of respect. And the fact that I've been wounded also helped me a lot, you know, mm. show off the scars a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Is that something you did early on to kind of ingratiate yourself amongst them? Uh, yeah, I always, I always do it. Yeah. Not with everyone, obviously, but with those type of character, with those guys, I think it was one of the things to do just to get the trust, to win the trust of them. James, let's talk a little bit more about this idea of trust. Of course, it's it's ever so critical in any sort of documentary film endeavor, but um, you know. <clears throat> How, how do you, I guess, what is some of your approach when you're working in these sort of conflict areas or on the front lines, if you will? What is sort of your approach to gaining trust of your subjects? And also in that answer, talk again about the importance of that in these films. So, I mean, it's something we think about a lot. You know, all the films that we do, if, it's, if they're observational and kind of character driven, the most important thing is that you have the trust of the people that you're filming. They allow you access to things that, you know, as an outsider, you would assume they might want to keep hidden. Uh, and it's a slow process, but I've always found that the, the most crucial thing is actually being straight with people, yeah. you know, and, and not coming across as kind of smarmy, not trying to trick people. And generally people respond well to that. You know, don't pretend this film's going to make them a star. Don't pretend you're only going to show the good things. You know, I, I did a film about, um, like I mentioned, the, a police shooting in, in the States in Virginia. Right. And we'd film mainly, this, this police officer had killed two uh, 
unarmed young men yeah. uh, four, exactly four years apart. And we'd filmed the whole murder trial basically from the perspective of the victim's family, sort yeah. of trying to get justice. Yeah. And then basically at, at the end of the process, the opportunity arose for us to, to meet his wife and, and to potentially talk to him. And now, you know, I could have gone in there and said, this film is about how great the police are, how it's such an impossible job, and we want to understand it from, you know, totally from your perspective. Yeah. But that would have been a lie. And I think people are smart enough on the whole to, to pick up on that. And mm. so I had to say to them, the reality is this film is going to say bad things about, you know, your husband or, or you know, you. Wow, wow. Uh, and, but it will be a more fair, better film if you guys take part in it. And you'll be happy with the end product. And how was that response? It was, I mean, I was shocked. So we, we first met the wife and she obviously had a lot to get off her chest. And yeah. so she, she did the interview, felt like we'd asked, you know, these reasonable questions. But then the, I guess the surprising thing was then we met, we met the police officer who wow. completely felt he'd been wronged by this whole process sure. of being charged with murder for basically what he thought was doing his job. And again, you know, we we we've spoken to his ex-wife, we've spoken to his ex-boss. We knew lots of stuff about his his history that was going to be in the film, and yeah. we'd filmed. He'd seen us in court with the families of the victims, right, right. And so we just had to say, like, this this film is happening, and it is about you. And so, you know, this it's going to be better if you can answer for yourself and and help people understand mm. your perspective. And and because we were straight with them, and there was what I remember there was one awkward moment as we were about to start the interview with him which we never thought would happen. And he said, you know, I really hope you're not playing us. And I had a terrible moment of guilt thinking, oh God, are we playing them? You know, but actually we weren't, you know, the film was critical of him, but his, he's, he still hasn't watched it. He went to, to prison, but his wife watched it. And because I'd warned her about all the bad stuff that was going to be in there, yeah. she liked that. She liked the film, you know? And, wow. it, and so I think, and, and I never would have thought that in a million years. Yeah. 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 And I think, that that taught me a lot, I think, because if you're straight with people about your intentions and you don't pretend that you're just doing a PR job for them, mm. but you, but you know you bond with them, you have something in common with everyone, and you find common ground and you sympathise where they deserve sympathy, and you're just kind of a, a decent human with them. Mm. People do trust you, and that's when you get the best stuff. They let you know they let their guard down. They're natural. They allow you to film stuff. You know, um, James, along those lines, I mean, with do you have a what I'm curious what your opinion and what your sense is of other doc filmmakers? And I mean, and we're going to get into a little bit of generalizations here, so we'll, we can be careful of that. But I'm curious what you feel like in general. Do you feel like doc filmmakers set out to be honest and truthful in that similar fashion? Uh, to begin with or do you feel like we as doc filmmakers all tend to have a tendency to we have a tendency to have our own agendas or an agenda for a film what's your general sort of feel about doc filmmakers in that case yeah i think there's there is a danger sometimes when doc filmmakers are tackling subjects that are sensitive or controversial and they're dealing with real people's lives yeah. that they can allow their agenda or ambition for the film to get the better of them and you know they're not trained journalists they may be not experienced in dealing with that particular subject matter yeah and i you know and for me that is problematic if you know the the film that you end up producing is is radically different from the one that you propose to your contributors you right, know right, right right i think you know I, I come from more of a like current affairs background although you know hopefully <laughs> the films in style are, are very much films doc and we'll documentaries, stay, yeah. <laughs> but, but but still still have that like grounding in you've got to be straight with people. And you know, and, and interestingly in the Philippines, we you know, we had it where, you know, they they must have known that we wanted to make a film about the, the murder of Strugs War. You know, we went to the absolute hotspot epicenter yep. of Duterte's Drugs War that had been in the news because they'd been caught basically executing a teenager. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was no point in us pretending that we wanted to glorify the cops and, you know, but there, there are ways of, of being honest with them, but still is establishing bonds. Like Olivier said, you know, they were really impressed that Olivier had been on the front line in Iraq. Right. You know, they, they liked the fact that Olivier knew about guns and motorbikes and stuff like that. So although so over, the, over time we found common ground without ever 
pretending we were there to do a PR job. For oh, the police, absolutely. You know? And that's, and that's a, a big part of the beauty of, of a film like this. And I think doc films in general, because it gives us an opportunity, you know, often, you know, whether it's through the media or through education or, 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 or whatnot, you know, we tend to have, certainly our worldviews can be shaped in a, in a certain way. Um, and, 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 and what I appreciate, because a lot of the work that I do tends to be in developing countries, particularly in Southeast Asia. And one sure. of the things that I really try to do with my films and the work, including the actual approach to the work, is, is I want to try to understand cultures in a way and be able to show that in a way or even an event or, um, you know, in your case, something that's happening in current events in in the Philippines to be able to show it in a light that's maybe not not normally seen um yeah. not intentionally to show it in a different light but i guess what I, it's a long-winded me, way of me saying our thoughts can be shaped easily by something certainly like the media right and i find yeah. that going to the source and actually trying to discover it on your own and meeting directly with the people that are being talked about and nine times out of 10, you really end up leaving that uh, sort of experience feeling that, wow, there was a lot more complexities here, a lot more to the story than I was being shown. And um, and certainly you guys are doing that with on the president's orders. I think that's exactly right. And, and, and one thing that we're asked sometimes is whether uh, we see ourselves as activists. And I think both Olivier and I don't particularly like that term being applied to us. You oh, know, no. We're, I, I'm we're, sure. you know, we're, we're, we're journalists and filmmakers. I think the, the term activist implies you go into a situation with a closed mind. Totally. And maybe, you, maybe you ignore those nuances and complexities that you mentioned. And that's not to say that the film at the end doesn't have a powerful message. Yeah. And, you know, activists may want to use it as part of their kind of campaign or whatever. And that's fine. If we've shone a light on it, then that's great. And, you know, I think that the Philippines film was important because we did get access. But I think the fact that we're not act activists, we're, we're journalists and filmmakers, made it easier for us to get that access in the first place because we went in there just wanting to film as much as we could, get to the heart of it, get inside these guys' heads. And I think had we gone in there with an agenda just for it to be completely, you know, having made up our minds before we started rolling, I think it would have been quite a different film. The Philippine leader has faced criticism for launching a drug war in his country. We all know already who these people are. Drug watch list is a report that these people are using drugs. Why not let them understand the consequences that will happen if they'll continue these things? So the film that we keep alluding to here is the current film on the president's orders. Olivier or James, I think it would be appropriate at this point to to give us a little peek into what the film is about, and then we'll start discussing the specifics of it. Yeah, sure. so, so basically we, like I said, we, we've been following the, the phenomenon of Duterte's drugs war, seeing these incredible photographs of dead bodies on the streets night after night. But we, we kind of felt that the story had become a bit formulaic. People mm. weren't, you know, you'd see a dead body, you'd maybe see a crying family, but you didn't really understand how the killing was happening, how the people who were doing the killing could justify it. So we set out to kind of get access to the, to the police to understand how they thought this was acceptable and to understand, you know, the mechanics of it. And also to humanise the victims' families more than they were being. You know, it was just to see them endlessly crying, it, it starts to just kind of wash over you. We wanted to kind of understand their, their lives a bit. So mm. basically, we, we, we got access to Kalaokan police in, in Manila, which is like the, the, the hot spot, the epicenter, which had been a very controversial spot for, for these kind of killings. And we spend the best part of six months filming with them and going on operations, filming them, you know, in their downtime, drinking beers by the beach mm. and generally kind of get it, getting inside their heads to the point where at the end of the film, near the climax, when we kind of ask them about these killings that are yeah. happening, because basically the film starts and they promise to stop killing. So it's like there's a new police chief who promises to, you know, cl clean up the police. They're going to stop killing people. Yeah. In the drug store. I say, and, and then as the film goes on, you realise They've stopped doing it in quite such a brazen way. They're not doing it in uniform, but yeah. perhaps it's gone underground and the killing's still happening. 
And I've been following the Duterte story for, for quite some time. I think I mentioned early on in the conversation that a lot of the work I do tends to be in Southeast Asia, although I have yet to have uh, shot anything in the Philippines. Duterte himself is, uh, dare I say, a f- an absolutely fascinating character. And, uh, yeah. but you know, it, and it feels like a particularly prescient time to be talking about these heads of states and the, eff- and the, and the effect that's happening in these countries. You mentioned this idea of access, and you both can kind of speak to this. I, I'm hopeful that you will. Um, access is is critical for something like this, and 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 I'm curious, how did you go about initially gaining access? Certainly, you know, to to the police force in the town. Like this is, uh, it's extraordinary the access you have. And and were there ever moments, you know, where they were? I guess talk about the process of gaining that access. And then I'm curious, you know, how if they were ever concerned that the people that they might be going after would ever be tipped off by having a film crew such as yourselves around. Sure. Olivier, do you want to answer that one? You can start it. I will continue. Okay. Yeah, so, so basically we, we came on a recce to Manila and we, you know, we'd heard of Calaoca and actually a, a local Filipino journalist told us about Modiquio, the new police chief, being a big character. And she said, you know, there's a chance he'll, he'll let you film. And we thought because it was such a controversial time and such a controversial place, we, we weren't optimistic. But I'll then bet. Show, <laughs> and then, you know, we thought he'd laugh at us, frankly. But oh, yeah. We, we showed up in his office, waited 15 minutes, and then started talking to him. And just immediately, he said, yeah, you can film. And it was, you know, it's that perfect combination of like, ego and vanity yes. that meant he loved the idea of us flying halfway around the world to make a film about him. And, you know, it was never formalized. It was never, we never had permission from the superiors, but wow. so we we're always dependent on his kind of say so. Yeah. Um, but from, from very early on, we were allowed to, to do whatever we wanted. So then it was just a, a case of, of building the trust with the individual officers. But Olivier, do you want to add something? Yes, and, and, and you said it already, we never had uh, an official authorization from, mm. the, from the press center, from, from the police. We knew that if we were going by the press center, we would probably have someone watching our back and probably have a deadline. We might be able for, to film for a couple of weeks mm. and we will not be able to get that more intimate access. Right. Uh, so it was uh, at some point, I think we were able, we spent so much time with them in the police station. Yeah. And I think we are able to come in and out. No one will ever ask us for our paperwork, right, for our right. ID. We could just go to the police station, to the jail, to the SWAT team, to the office of the commander and just wait for hours and you know, being friendly with the people, getting the trust. And nobody was bothered about our presence. Actually, people were completely forgot about us. Actually. Yeah. Yeah, like lots of films, there was a lot of waiting around. Um, right. <laughs> and and, and I, I guess, like, responding to, to your second bit of the question, that the fact that we didn't have written authorization made us nervous because, you know, Modicchio is a kind of hot-headed guy. Yeah. He could have, we could have showed up one morning and he said, actually, do you know what? We're done. You can't film anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. We shut, shut or, or we, we, did, we said or we did the wrong thing or whatever. So there was, there was that nervousness. But there was actually only one moment when the police themselves got worried about something we'd filmed and it was uh basically they were busting like a cock fighting mm. and at, and it was like mad it was like madness it was like a cartoon there were like chickens and feathers and everything flying everywhere <laughs> and people running in all directions and then one of the officers pulls out a gun yeah and, and olivia was filming as he did that and he didn't shoot the guys who was running but you know he got the gun out Ooh. and they, they they kind of freaked out about us having filmed that which was weird given that all the stuff they'd said and done on camera but, uh, you know, we just said, no, we're not going to delete it. Yeah, and, yeah. and that was that. So it was, you know, it, it was a case of just like feeling our way a little bit. But, um, yeah, there was no, there was never any, any sense that they were kind of controlling what we, we could and couldn't film it. They were pretty, pretty open on the whole. So, okay, along those lines, Olivier, I would love to ask you, you know, how you are feeling, and this isn't in some very specific moments in the film, how were you feeling, Olivier, being a European, a non-Filipino, you're wielding a camera while a Filipino man is is in front of you, utterly distraught, and and it's in particular, it's the, I think it's the Jimmy Ause's arrest, and you're wielding a camera, 
and it's pointed directly at him as the police are searching his house. You know, all the while sort of holding gun, you know, at gunpoint, they're essentially searching his house. He even looks at the camera a number of times. I'm curious, in these moments, how are you feeling and what's going through your mind during these moments? And in and, and what, if any, what is your responsibility as a doc filmmaker? And then again, how are you feeling being a European filming these moments, filming a Filipino man in, in this instance? Well, I would say intimate personal feelings usually come after the filming. Mm. So when I film, I usually create a space between me and, and the character, the mm. people that I film. Mm. I'm here to film. The emotion can come later. I don't let myself drown into, drown into a situation where I'm not capable to, to film anymore because maybe I'm feeling too emotional or, or stress. So I need to create that space uh, when, when I film, really. Yeah. Uh, I have been filming in so many countries all over the world. <laughs> the world. Sorry, I've been living in Asia actually for 17 years. Yeah. <clears throat> I was living in, in Thailand. And I think sometime as a foreigner, as a, uh, an outsider, I don't mean that it makes the things easier, but sometimes the, the, the connection, it's, it's different. I don't know if I make clear, sorry, my, because my French sometimes is... My English sometimes is not very good. It's okay. I, ju I just got back from working in Cambodia three months with a French cinematographer, so I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. So, so yeah, no, the, the, what is most important for me is to, to film what's happening. You know, I'm here to do a job. I'm here to be the witness, so right. I need to get the pictures. Always have compassion for the people I'm filming. Yeah. You know, I'm trying my best to not be too intrusive. The space I was filming was very, very small. You know, that was, you know, they were like five, six, seven cops around us, oh, yeah. plus the, the other people from the family. So I saw him watching the, the Lancer a couple of times. Oh, yeah. But I thought that moment was so important. You know, when I was wounded uh, in 2011, one thing that was important for me is to have that big Pictures. A friend of mine took the shot of me when I was wounded, mm. and how thought for me to have that pictures was actually very important. Mm. And you know, I kind of think like Jimmy Hosa was probably happy that we were around. To be honest, uh, uh. I think things could have turned much more complicated yeah, if the foreigner, the Westerner, the film crew yep. was not there. Yeah, yeah. And somehow, I don't, I don't mean that. You know, we change, you know, the film crew change the destiny of Jimmy Osa. Yeah. Uh, but we know for a fact, uh, and James can, can tell you what happened uh, before we arrived to the house, before just a moment before the arrest, where uh, when one of the guys, the, the special operation team, mm. was nearly ready to shoot the guy. Oh boy. James, can you explain maybe? Yeah, so about a week later, when we, when we went on a kind of away day with the special operations unit, one of the officers let slip to us off camera that he'd been the one who had grabbed Jimmy, who basically jumped off the roof and then he, he'd grabbed him in the alleyway before. Yeah. So we, we were just behind, we were kind of running up to the house and he, he had his gun to Jimmy's head Whoa. and he looked to his boss and said, you know, can I do it? Oh. And the boss said, boss said no. And he, he thought that was probably because we were about to show up with our oh, camera. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so, which is kind of chilling, but yeah, I, th I think it's, it's a really interesting question. And I think both of us wanted to be, you know, we're filming people in really difficult, uh, stressful and pleasant situations often. And so you, it's, it's, there's never a simple answer. You know, I think it's, there's a balance between being respectful to their space mm. and feeling like it's important to capture the reality of what's happening. So, you know, similarly in, in the, in the jail, you know, we're filming people and the, the jailer starts hitting them with a stick, you yeah, know, and yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. that's horrific. And, but, but equally it feels important to show that this is the, the reality of what it's like to be in a Filipino jail, you know. But that doesn't mean it's not uncomfortable and we don't kind of think about what our presence there means and all those things. But it's, I think, like, as a filmmaker, particularly as someone who's not from that country, mm. you just have to be really conscious of these things at mm. all time mm. and understand there's not a simple answer. 
you know, obviously if your presence is making a situation worse, then you have to really think, is it worth me being there? But right. I think on the whole, we, we thought that our presence wasn't making it worse and, you know, it needed to be documented. Thank you, James. And Olivier, just to kind of double back on what you were saying about yes. this idea of as a shooter, having a separation between yourself, uh, having some space between the lens and the subject. Um, it's something that I am, am, am always consciously aware of as a shooter myself. Now, I haven't worked in direct conflict zones. I'm all, all almost always uh, operating in post-conflict areas, most recently in the case of, of Cambodia, you know, post-genocide. And what I have found is even, you know, the types of, air, in terms of separation, when an event is happening on camera that may be, well, uh, maybe a, a fairly sticky situation for the subjects that are involved, I'm able to have the removal in that process. I, I want to honor the moment. I want to honor, you know, what I'm filming at that moment. But it's interesting. I actually have less of a, um, I'm less equipped to do that i tend to emotion tends to get more in the way during the quieter moments maybe dare i say even a formal moment where i'm having an interview with a subject and i always have found that interesting that sort of when i'm filming in action i have no problem with what's happening in front of the lens in terms of keeping my emotion out of it and honoring that event but sometimes during the actual interview process that's where i do sometimes emotions kind of um can uh, can kind of get in the way, and I wonder if if yeah, you guys yeah. have ever experienced that. Maybe maybe you have, James. I think that's a really it's a really interesting point, and I think Olivier and I are probably slightly different in that way. And that Olivier is amazing at kind of making himself invisible. Yeah. He becomes a camera, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's not about the interaction between him and the contributor, right? Uh, whereas, like when I've been filming myself or doing interviews, as you say. It is more about that interaction. So you're there, mm. you're there as a human, not just as a camera. Mm. And so that, you know, I've found I've often cried when I've been filming stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And, and and I think that's okay in certain circumstances. I think, you know, for the type of like verite filming Olivia does, it's an amazing skill that he can kind of disappear. Um, and that takes like total focus. But it's it's different. And yeah, I think in an interview when you are emotionally engaging with with your contributor, it would be very strange if you, if you weren't emotionally affected. You know. I agree. There, 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 there's something else that they'd like to add. I'm, I'm not someone that like to rush filming. Hmm. Like when oh, we... that's obvious. That's obvious. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> no, I, I totally, oh man. Yeah, that's obvious in your cinematography. So when we go to a scene, when we meet people, sometimes I don't have I don't even have the camera with me yet. Yeah. You know, I always take the time and, and like James said, I'd like you know, being invisible mm. and, and, and to get there, you know, I need to, I need to feel the connection with mm. the people I'm filming. Mm. That is very important for me. Mm. Of course, sometimes when is action happening, you don't have time to build that connection. Like for Jimmy Osa, he was there and I arrived and I start to film. Yeah. It was happening. That was the moment. But, uh, in general, and sometimes, you know, I know when it's time to stop recording. Mm. You know, I'm just, you know, I'm not, I'm not someone that, again, I film a lot. Not only I'm not rushing a lot, but I don't film a lot. Uh, like, for example, I don't know how much, for Mosul, I spent maybe four months on the ground, mm. uh, shooting mostly run and gun actuality action. And I think I have maybe James 30 hours, 40 hours of, of yeah. rushes. Mm. Yeah. So it's not much. I think we have probably less. Uh, in, in the Philippines. Wow, um, that's amazing. Yeah, that's very surprising. Uh, it's, it's surprising on one hand as a doc filmmaker, but but also, but seeing the way that you, sh that you shot on the president's orders, I'm not surprised. I get it. It's very, very well thought out, the, the, the shot construction. And actually, the, the way we did it with this film, which is different from Oso, is I was recording sound, so I would kind of keep rolling. Yeah. So Olivier... Ah, so that's it, how it, some of the sound clips got in there once the camera was shut off. Right. Well, that's exactly. Yeah. Um, but that that you know. So I'd I'd be curious to know how many hours actually of of rushes, including the sound of audio. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, Olivier has like an incredible eye for like the shots that make up a sequence. So you know, it makes the edit process mm. like a dream. The police have faced mounting criticism and accusations of corruption. Pag-ing Presidente, si Duterte. 
Tapos, sumito na siya sa pagda-drugs. Alam namin na kasali siya sa drug watch list. President Duterte moved deliberately put in place a permission structure for mass murder. You've talked a bit about, obviously, the access that you guys have with the police force there in the town. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, if we could, the access to the gang that you have access to. I mean, <laughs> they must have known you were also filming the police, right? So again, building up trust here is 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 tantamount. It's critical here for the documentary. How did you, I mean, how did you get in with the gang, knowing the type of film that you were shooting and that you were also working with the police? And did, and did each other know that you were filming one another? Did the gang know? Did the police know? How did that work? Yeah, so, so with, with the family, we were basically... We saw the the clip of the, the CCTV footage of the dad being oh. killed, and so we then basically went with our local fixer to the street where it had happened, mm. asked the kind of taxi drivers, you know, where this family lived. And I, for, to be honest, that we really struggled to get to them for a while. They didn't really want to talk. They oh, thought, wow. you know, who are these guys? Oh, yeah. And it and it was it was actually mainly because the police no longer had a copy of the CCTV, and so. We, we just had to keep going back to the family. And and so we'd kind of almost given up on being able to film with the family because oh, wow. it was just taking so long and they were so, you know, reluctant to talk to us. And But we needed the, we really wanted the original CCTV. So yeah. then yeah. eventually one day we went down this alley and, and the, the guy's girlfriend called us up and we went and sat there and we were talking to him about what had happened, you know, talked about the CCTV. And as the conversation went on, I think Olivia and I both got the feeling like, this guy is a great character. Uh -huh. You know, the way he talks, the way he looks, just his whole manner. Yeah. He's kind of got this like movie star vibe about him. And um, and as the conversation went on, I think at the end we were like, do you maybe consider us doing a bit of filming? And he was immediately like, yeah, sure. Wow. Uh, and so then we were actually due to fly out the next morning and we, we called back to London and said, we've got to extend our trip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, they were, they gave just a completely different side of, of that world, yeah. you know, and they knew we'd film with the police. We, did, we never told the police we were filming with them because okay. we didn't want to yeah. pull too much attention to The police knew we were filming other stuff yeah. like in the slums. But we didn't want to draw too much attention. So every time we went into their like apartment in the slum, we'd be pretty careful in terms of like carrying kit and drawing too much attention. We tried to do it, you know, secretly. So, but yeah, and they were great. You know, they were they, again. The access was, in in a way, kind of easy once the once we had that meeting and got on with them, and they wanted to tell the story of their dad. They were kind of a joy to to film with, to be honest. The film that we've been talking about is On the President's Orders. Uh, gentlemen, how can we see the film? What is the distribution run? What's happening right now with that? So we're playing at Hot Docs uh, at the end of April, early May in Toronto. Then it will be at a few other festivals which haven't been announced yet. Maybe a, a, a kind of short theatrical run in, in the US and uh, UK. Mm. And then it will be bro broadcast on PBS, BBC and Arte in the fall. And we would, I would be negligent not to mention the association, of course, we haven't even gotten to this PBS frontline. Uh, tell, can you tell us briefly how that happened? And, uh, and, and if you have some idea when frontline will air it? Sure. So, so we did Mosul for, for frontline as well. Um, and they've been fantastic. I've, I've made about five or six films for them over the years and they are just great to work with. They're serious. They, you know, they have the funding and the time and they've been really supportive of me and Olivier making a film mm. that's, you know, slightly out of the ordinary frontline style, you know, both both Mosul and on the president's orders. There's no narration. It's not kind of talking head interviews. It's not, you know, overtly investigative. It's right. it's cinematic. Right. It's filmic. It's uh, char character based. And I think, you know, I think that is a sign that frontline have ambitions to kind of move more into the like, you know, festival world out of out of purely just a broadcast space. Um, you know, they've got another film this year for Summer, um, which won an award at South by Southwest. They've had Abacus a, a year or two ago, which mm, we had was Steve. On, we had Steve on the program last year. Yeah, I mean, Steve is amazing. Yeah, and you know, and they got nominated for an Academy Award for that one. Yeah. So I think there's, you know, Frontline. Rainy Aronson, who runs Frontline, is is very ambitious to 
to take it in lots of different directions, whether that be podcast or virtual reality or, you know, kind of cracking the film festival world. And that's been great for me and Olivier because, you know, our, our style, our taste is very much, you know, more cinematic. So, and they've given us the, the space to do that, which is, which is great. Which is fantastic. We've been speaking with filmmakers James Jones and Olivier Sarbiel. I'm going to go ahead and put links, gentlemen, to your works up in the show notes for this episode, as well as other information about the work that you guys have done. Olivier and James, I could easily continue this conversation for hours. Uh, it's It's been amazing, and um, I'm eager to continue exploring your careers and seeing where, where more of this takes you. James... Olivier, thank you so much for being a part of the program. I really appreciate you taking the time out today. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you so much, Chris. Hey, everyone. I wanted to jump on one more time and remind you that our first session of the Doc Lifer Elite Mastermind, it begins on May 7th. So we'd love to have you join our mastermind. And if you'd like to fill out an application or if you'd like to read more information about the mastermind, just head to thedocumentarylife.com slash mastermind. Thanks, and we'll see you next week. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.